Okay, it's time for uh, your questions. Uh, thank you very much, guys. Uh, all these questions have come from my Instagram followers. Uh, so we're going to put these questions to Mr. Hare. Now, are you ready for these? Um, throw them at me, Skipper. Okay. Who's your top five snooker players? Um, Davis, number one, of course. Um, <laughs> I've got to say that, he's my mate. Um, you, Ronnie O'Sullivan, John Higgins. The fifth one, he's Ooh, split Alex between half Jimmy? a dozen. No. no. Jimmy, oh, Jimmy's such a frustration because he should be in the top four, mm. but he, he never. I, I think the trumps of this world are, are on the way, mm. but they're not there yet. I'm going to play the safeguard and I'm going to go fifth joint Alex and Jimmy. Okay. I'm not, I'm not convinced I'm telling the <laughs> truth there. Will Eddie get involved in snooker? I don't think so. He told me on day, when we had a reorganisation of family, when you get old, you have reorganisations, you know, so shares get distributed and the next level of people, like Eddie's the major shareholder now in Matchroom Sport, and the first thing he told me, when I explained this comes with responsibilities, you know, you have to have passion, you have to be really involved, you have to understand it, and he said, I, I'm not particularly bothered about snooker. <laughs> so I said, well, let's do it. We want to hear that. Yeah, but if, if you're in, the, if you believe that, then okay. Make sure mm. the team that you appoint are, mm. and the team. I think with Dawson, although he's my right hand man, he understands what I feel about sport. And Jason Ferguson, I've got a lot of time for on the WPBSA. Eddie can still be useful from a commercialisation aspect without him being in love with the sport. Yeah. Sometimes a lot of associations around the world in different sports are in love with the sport but have no idea to commercialise. Okay. So here we've got someone who's not in love with the sport mm. but understands the value of a pound note, understands that this is one of the assets of our family and will commercialise. So he could be very useful, right. time will tell. Okay. When will be the first million pound first prize? It's a good question. You see, that could happen quite quickly, but it might be the worst thing that could ever happen to the game. Because uh, was there talk when the Saudi was going to be on that that was going to be more than the world? No, and they, it wasn't they, allowed or no, something. They, no, it, they wanted to do the biggest event they could do, and I said to them, "You can't endanger the status of the world." Right. So your prize money is the same as the world's, and they were quite happy with that. Right. It's easy to do. But is it creating the sustainable business I'm looking for? Right. Million pounds, half a million, three quarters, really it doesn't matter if it's consistent with the status of the game. Because what, if you have one event with a million pound prize money, does that relegate the perception of value for all the other yeah. events in the tour? And the answer is yes. Mm. And if we're gonna have one event that's big, and I think the World Championships will go up in stages to a million, I think it might take Five years, mm. six years, just depends. Mm. If I took uh, if I took the snooker out of the crucible, it'd be a million pounds straight away. Yeah. Because the Saudis, the Chinese, or where would probably pay 10, 15, 20 million just to stage it in today's yeah. world. But then that's a price to pay as well, and I'm not in favour of that price. Yeah. I, went the, I want the best of both worlds, as always. Okay. So I'd like to see a million pound, but I'd like it to be for the World Championships, because as an event, that's where we should aim to get everything. And by the way, the Masters, the, it's interesting, the BBC, mm. the three BBC events are still head and shoulders above everything yeah. else. Yeah. And that's good, because mm. they're the blue ribbon. Yeah. Underneath that, you've got some big events. Well, they, 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 say, well, they, they stay at the same venue all the time, where the other ones sort of flit around so you can't get an identity, surely. Well, we've tried it with York, with the UK. I, yeah. I'm not saying that's worked 100%. Right. You know, I think we could take another event in London, for example, mm -hmm. because it's a long time, 12 months before the yeah. next Masters come up. So we, I think we've got to be fresh thinking and we've got to be a little bit risk takers. And I think maybe there's an argument to go back to a little bit of theatre land. Right. Because they are, you know, some of those older events, they create atmosphere and that's what you need. But where we have done well, we're selling more tickets to the general public than we've ever sold before. Right. They're selling faster than we've ever sold. So that means, to me, means there's latent demand out there. So come on boys and girls, <laughs> get your hands dirty. Let's get to work. Uh, will the World Championship stay at the Crucible? I hope so. I mean, again, we've got a contract for another four years. And I think we all know that the Crucible is too small. We don't want to lose the atmosphere of the Crucible, but it's a hell of a price to pay when you've got 800 seats to sell. Mm. So, you know, the, the gauntlet's been laid down to Sheffield City Council in a nice way. Is look, you know, we think we're part of Sheffield. Sheffield thinks the snooker's part of them. Well, that's, that's talking the talk. Now walk the walk. Mm -hmm. Don't build me a new venue, part of your new development. Give me two and a half, three thousand seats. It doesn't have to be a monster, mm -hmm. but that would enable me to add a million plus to the gate. 
and yeah. maybe to get us to the million pound prize money. It's not one way traffic. Right. We run sustainable businesses at Matrim and they have to make a profit. Right. All our businesses make a profit. It's, it's an argument for saying if you're going to build a venue in Sheffield, build a, a multi-purpose one, you could have all the qualifiers there as well or well, would no, that not work? It could work, but the thing is, if you're going to build a venue that itself is sustainable, it needs to be used. Right. So you go to Madison Square Gardens, and I was there the other day watching a basketball game. 11 o'clock, basketball finished, the crowd left. 20 past 11, bulldozers come in. Mm. Half past one in the morning, it was an equestrian centre. <laughs> that's called graft. Yeah. And that's what we don't do enough of in this country. So for Sheffield to build a new arena that is sustainable, mm. it's got to attract other events to make it sustainable. Can't just be the World Championships. Qualifiers are qualifiers. I'm sorry it's not purpose-made conditions at a crucible, yeah. but get used to it. I'll tell you how you avoid that. Don't be in the qualifiers. <laughs> yeah. Be good enough to get up the ranks and then you're there by light. Well, this next question is actually something to do with that. They're saying, why is the prize money so top heavy? Because the top heavy people deliver it. Yeah, you know, I, 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 I agree. I mean, look, yeah. at the end of the day, Sport I mean, is tough. We, sport has got to be tough because mm. that's what creates superstars and, mm. and superstars deserve to have a lifestyle that other people aspire to. Mm. And if you take that away, you end up with just mediocrity right the way through. Mm. How many people, I, we started this year paying players 20,000 pound guarantee, right? Mm. I voted against it, we still did it. I think they were right. I think right. the 20 grand was, okay boys, there's a start, there's your exes yeah. paid. Beyond that, do me a favour. Sports yeah. for winners. Yeah. It's not for people just to turn up, because otherwise everybody would be doing exactly. it. We are talking about the elite taking the rewards, and trust me, that ain't changing. <laughs> what happens when Ronnie retires? When he retires, I hope he has a happy life and enjoys his time and realises the contribution he's made to the sport, sticks his shoulders back and his chest out and feels proud of himself. He's been a fabulous ambassador. Mm. He's been a pain in the arse on occasions. <laughs> but that's what geniuses do. Well, we you talked know, earlier about if you miss you, but if you deliver, and he delivers. Of course, but Alex Higgins was a pain in the arse. Mm. Jimmy White on occasions was a pain in the arse. But they were geniuses. Mm. And people, ordinary people like me, have to appreciate that. Which is why he gets a bit of leeway every now and again. Not too much. Mm. But we'd be poorer without him. What do we do when he retires? The next level will move in, and they'll surprise you. And you'll be saying in three years after that, Ronnie O'Sullivan, yeah. Is he as good as Sid Smith or Frank right. Jones? Right. Because they're always, sport evolves superstars. If the sport is vibrant, as we must ensure that it always is, superstars will come through. What's your vision for snooker in the next 10 years? I want to see snooker expand itself out of leisure centres and into mainstream arenas. I still think we have, for a global sport, we have too many events in the UK. Mm -hmm. I'm desperate to close these deals in the Middle East, and I'm desperate to see China back on track. Well, there's one, Hong Kong was there not seven and a half thousand yeah. people for an event in Hong Kong. And by the way, the venue hold the venue. I think it was nine thousand people. The venue held fourteen thousand, and they cut the right. they cut the capacity yeah. because of COVID. So it could have done more. I really govern myself, and I judge myself on prize money levels. You know, when I took over snooker in well, when it, many years ago mm -hmm. now, uh, the prize money was three and a half million. Yeah. Covid set us back a bit, obviously, mm. without China, but we're now on track to get to 20. And then I want to see it, obviously, get to 30, because I believe that snooker is more valuable a commercial property than golf. It hits bigger yeah. numbers, it appeals to a wider number of, of, of players, and I think it's purely a perception issue as to why people don't value certain sports mm. as much as other sports. So the really big job, and this is where the players come in, because they're our ambassadors, is to sell snooker. Sell it to a, a range of sponsors that have never looked at snooker before. Sell it to countries that have never had it before. Mm. Break barriers. And we'll be judged by the prize money. The first stage, get it over 20, and then go up in tens and see how far you can go. It's only a game, isn't it? <laughs> uh, what's happening with the Saudi tournament? Well, we are very close. We are now actually talking dates, can you believe? It's only taken three years. Right. These things don't happen quickly. It's a massive event. But more than that, it sets a precedent for the whole of the Middle East, which is another area which I think we could do better. Mm. Is, there, is there snooker tables there? Yes, oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, they play a lot of nine ball pool there as well. Right. So we're, we're discussing doing a 10 year deal. So it was, so the contract's not signed. Mm. But it's a 10 year deal as part of their 10 year policy for sport in Saudi to encourage youngsters. And this will involve probably setting up academies there, 
putting referees, training referees, doing the whole job from the mm. beginning. The players won't be good enough at the moment, but they'll, as we started off in, when yeah, you were there yeah. in Southeast Asia and places like that, you know, you, you do win 6 0 a lot. Yeah. But one day you go there and you lose 6 5. Yeah. And you know, you realise they're making progress. Yeah. So Saudi's close. In my world, it's never done until the check hits my bank account. The moment he realised snooker was scalable into a big money world sport. I think the Masters, at ben which was the Benson Hedges yeah. at Wembley. Yeah. And I walked around that and I, it suddenly seemed to me there was a bigger world out there than I'd been used to. You know, used to money matches and great small tournaments, you know, Tolly Cobbold and things mm. like that. But the Masters suddenly looked, this sport is scalable. Mm. And then, obviously, when we first went to Asia, 1982, I did the first show at the Great Hall of the People. This was just six months before Tenement Square, I think it was. Right. But the whole of the Chinese government came to watch. And I thought, we could have something here. Right. So yeah, we're only limited by our own imagination. But scalable, so I think, first time was definitely the Bensons. OK. Five dinner guests. Five dinner guests. Me, 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 <laughs> me, and me. Because I know it'll be fun. Uh, Favourite sport, darts, darts or snooker? Uh, darts for the sheer size of the extravaganza and the fact that snooker players in my book are still a little bit spoiled. Mm. And I'm being highly critical here. I feel with darts players, I've got 128 people to a man and woman behind me. They will do everything right. to propel their sport, to create media opportunities. I don't get the same, exact same feeling completely with the membership mm. of Snooker. A little bit stuck in what they consider were the glory days, which actually weren't the glory days. Mm. Prize money today is bigger than it's ever been and getting bigger, viewership is bigger. They need to understand that this is a two-way street. And as I get older, I realise how much I need talent to do the job that I know I can do properly. Mm -hmm. And if I don't get the support, it's a negative. You know, when you see a young fighter start his career, honestly, you'd take punches for him because yeah. they're so committed. Yeah, yeah. And they'll do, you say, jump through that window, they'll jump through, they won't even think about it. They're committed to mm -hmm. their sport. Sometimes I don't find that so much in snooker. Right. I'm hoping that the new breed understand that that is as equally as important part of the game as knocking in balls yeah. at the end of the day. There's no point in being good unless you're famous. Yeah. You'll never earn the type of money. If you're good and famous, you're multi-millionaire. Mm. And that's what I want. But darts for the sheer speed of acceleration and the love that comes from the crowd who are having just a brilliant time. Yeah. I mean, when, when you buy a ticket for the darts, you don't know who you're going to watch. Because if you don't <laughs> buy them before... And well you before don't even draw. watch. No, they don't watch. <laughs> a lot of the 40% of the time they watch. We put timers on them. And, but they're going for a ticket of the darts. Yeah. So what I want to do with snooker really is I want people to buy a ticket for the snooker. Mm -hmm. I don't want it just to be the Ronnie O'Sullivan show. Yeah, yeah, as yeah. great a player as he is and a huge draw. No sport can rely on one person. Mm. In darts, no one really cares mm. so much. Of right. course they want to see the top players, but yeah, it's yeah. not life and death to them. Okay. Have you played any sport and how high a level? I played every sport and I've always been gold medal in enthusiasm and not even bronze in ability. <laughs> so you can't name a sport. I played cricket up to a reasonable standard, sort of county second eleven. Right. All-rounder, bowler, batter? All-rounder. I still right. play Essex over 70s. I'm, I'm bat three or four. I, I'm a death bowler, but I'm getting old and getting injured. So. Marathons all around the world. I mean, Brazil, Hong Kong, New York, everywhere. You told me you did a marathon, like, un unannounced. You just did, turned yeah. up and did one, didn't you, one yeah. time abroad? I was, in, I was in Brazil, and we were doing a show of Brazilian rules, Tony Mio and uh, Steve Davis. And I was jogging around the lake. Sorry about the story, but anyway, it's worth it. I was jogging around this lake every morning, because I like to keep fit anyway. And this old man came up to me and said, uh, would you like to run with me on Sunday? And I went, yeah, if you like. I said, look, he seemed a nice guy. I said, like, I'm over there, room, whatever. I'll see you Sunday morning. And Saturday night, we went out with the boys for a bad night. <laughs> it was late. I got in about, I don't know, I hope the wife don't watch this. <laughs> Four or five o'clock in the morning, much the worse for vodka. And about half past six, there's a knock on my door. And I opened the door, and there's this little old man there with his tracksuit on. He said, are you ready? I went, no, <laughs> mate, I've just got in. He went, oh, you promised me. And I've entered you as an elite athlete. 
I said, enter me in what? He said, it's the Brazilian marathon today. <laughs> and when, you're, when you've had a few drinks and you think you're a bit mad like I am, you think, do you know what? This might be fun. I nearly died. I nearly died. <laughs> but I finished anyway. But it was, uh, no, I think my best time, three hours, 22, which for a fat old geezer in his 40s who smoked, it's not bad, but everything I've done like that, golf, you know, I was down to 10 once and now I'm 24. Mm-hmm. I've got so much enthusiasm, so much to 50 give. 50 break of snooker. 56, but everything, it seems to be, I'm always there or thereabouts, which is why I ended up as being the world's best promoter. It's the only thing I've ever won, that award. <laughs> this next question is, it's, 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 it's some of that, if you don't have natural talent, is it worth pursuing a career in sport? No. I mean, what you've got to find out is, have you got natural talent? And sometimes that doesn't come through straight away. Mm. It's the most important thing in life, business and in sport, is you have to have a work ethic. If you have a work ethic, you will eventually be the best you can be. Yeah. And you won't know that until you've put in enough time, enough sacrifice to find out. Mm. Some people, you know, you don't take snooker and say, oh, I'll give it a week, I'm no good, do you? <laughs> and the same, boxing, any sport you yeah. like. So you will find out yourself, but you have to be a man enough to look in the mirror and say, I'm not good enough. Yeah. But before you make that call, you have to look in the same mirror and say, I have given this every inch of my soul. Mm. And then if you're not good enough, you'll yeah. know. <laughs> um, someone's writing in and says, snooker is all etiquette, but do you think mischief, legal mischief is a good thing? Yeah, always. I love characters. Yeah. I don't. I mean, I don't ever condone cheating of any mm. description, whether it's within the rules or outside the rules. But I love characters. Mm. They make the sport. So if you want to be a character, you, you get yourself noticed. Mm. You know? When I was a young chartered the accountant... You've got to back it up, though, haven't you, with, with well, players? Well. When I was a young chartered the accountant many years ago, it, it was a very snobbish world, and I was a working-class family. And I decided occasionally to go to work in a white suit which didn't go down at all well. <laughs> and the reason I did it was because I, I wanted to be noticed. <laughs> and I was good enough to back it up. So that's the secret. A character that can't back it up makes himself look ridiculous. Yeah. A character that does back it up is gold dust. What motivates you to get out of bed in the morning? I love every single second of my life. Every single second. I'm excited meeting you, <laughs> playing snooker. <laughs> when I go to work, I've done it before, I can put a pulse meter on me and my pulse is five beats faster. Just the excitement after 45 years in the business of going to work, of creating opportunity, of making money. It's all a game. My game is making money and I've been quite successful at it. I apply the same principles to sport and making money in that sport and that ticks a box. You can't have our profits going to there and prize money going down. So you've got to both live in the real that we've got to create sustainability. We survived COVID. People forget mm. we did more events during COVID mm. than we normally do. 90% of other sports in this country put their head in the sand and said, wake me up when it's over. We don't work like that. We mm. know our responsibilities, but we also recognise as a company, we were in a position to ignore COVID. We've got enough cash. Mm. We've got working capital. We run a proper business. Mm. But because of that, the excitement is intense. And you know, when I get a new project, Nine Ball Pool, I mean, I said to you earlier, I upgrade my world rankings by hand for 128 players, every snooker tournament and every darts tournament. Now that's not because I'm a sad bastard, although I probably am. It's because I'm in love with what I do. And every day is a blessing. What is your favorite film? The one that makes me smile the most and which sums up life for me is the Blues Brothers. Right. I just freaking love that film. Because <laughs> I sit there and, you know, all my life is all, it's just been about, let's just do it. And, you know, I love that attitude amongst people is, we're never going to live in a perfect world. We're never going to get every decision right. Mm. Let's just do it. Let's roll the dice, baby, and let's see what works out. <laughs> and snooker, we rolled the dice with snooker in 1974. It's 50 years ago Incredible, next year. It's my first event I was the southern area the Southern Area Championships between Sid Hood and Terry Griffiths <laughs> here in Romford, next door, boarded up the tables, there were six tables, put one in the middle, and we all sat around watching Terry Griffiths sing his way 
to the Southern Area Tower. <laughs> and you don't forget, I don't forget a second of my life because you've had ups and downs, but it's just been an unbelievable ride, unbelievable journey, and it just makes me smile I've thinking seen, I've never seen the Blues Brothers, I have to admit. What's Mate, your favourite food? I love Chinese. Right. Uh, Mr. Chow is my favourite restaurant, which I've been there for 40 years. I had the same course every time I got in <laughs> for 40 years. Uh, Indian, I like a good Indian. Right. Uh, the Cinnamon Club in London, obviously at Westminster, my favourite Indian restaurant. Right. I love English food. I love, do you know what? I love food. Yeah, I'm talking about me too. I, 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 just, find, it, I, I find it hard to pin it down to one, no, to one I, thing. It is tough, you know. I own, I own a little bit of a, a restaurant in London called Smith & Malinsky. Right. Which is probably the best station. Sean Murphy in goes in there. He, yeah, he yeah. says it's, it's incredible. It's, 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 it's good. So I get a free um, meal, will I? No. The <laughs> money you're making, you can pay. This podcast making him a fortune. You know that. <laughs> Even by watching it, you're making him money, which is quite sad, really. But he, you know, he deserves it. Big Last money. question: What is your biggest accomplishment? I have. Uh, I've no regrets, and mm. death does not worry me in the slightest. Wow. I've had an amazing, amazing run. And I'm not going to be grateful to anyone but God. Okay. Barry Heron, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank pleasure. you so Thanks, much. Thanks, Stephen. Really Good to appreciate talk it. To you. Thank you very much. And he still cheated in that game. <laughs> I won that. I won that game. <laughs>